Hello and welcome back to The Walking Dead Retrospective, where today we'll be wrapping up the arduous journey that is Season 7 and delving right into All Out War. As I've been saying a lot with Season 7, things here take a absolutely wild turn when it comes to comic differences, so don't be too surprised if the order of events and the events themselves don't necessarily translate between the two. And with that said, let us dive in. To really quickly catch you up on where we left off, in the book, following Negan's visits, which would of course be the mid-season finale of Season 7, All Out War basically begins then and there. In the show, on the other hand, these events are split between the aforementioned mid-season finale in Episode 8 and the finale of the season. Which, of course, means that while there are some remixes from the book, a vast majority of the second half of the season is TV show exclusive by default. So with that said, for the most part, today we'll be talking about all the stuff the TV show added, and how that changes the entirety of the Negan saga. As such, the first thing I want to note is the aftermath of the midseason finale and Rick's trip to the hilltop, where we see the legendary Daryl reunion scene. I don't think it's a hot take to say that this entire reunion with Daryl and Maggie is one of the greatest scenes in the season, if not the entire show. Because while the rest of the season sure has its ups and downs, the emotion packed into this single scene is absolutely incredible. And of course, Rick getting his revolver back signifies all of that. And if that isn't a perfectly written symbol of hope, then I really don't know what is. I've went on about this a lot in this series, but these are the types of scenes that, in my mind, make the entire arduous adaptation journey worth it. Because pulling something like this off in a black and white paper comic is much more difficult to say the least. And again, the acting from basically everyone we see here is just top notch. So yeah, a small scene in the grand scheme of things, but an absolutely incredible one. The first episode back from the mid-season break adapts a lot of what happened before Negan's visit in the book, where Rick goes to finally meet Ezekiel and the kingdom. In terms of narrative beats, much of it is quite similar, with the notable exceptions being Ezekiel's unwillingness to fight at first, whereas in the book he was all in right away, and of course the fact that Dwight doesn't pop up just yet. So again, that entire March to War storyline is just extended. Also in the show, since quite a few more people have been killed by Negan, we also get a few more added scenes of Morgan being caught up as to what has happened and things like that, but point is, the alliance, or even intention to fight for that matter, isn't established nearly as quickly. Though I do admit, the whole rock in the road story Rick tells after which the episode is also named is a pretty cool little addition to spice up this introduction. And of course, Jerry is just the best. The entire highway scene to follow is also entirely exclusive to the show. And a cool thing to note here is that this is the same filming location as the highway sequence with Sophia way way back in the season 2 premiere. Obviously in the universe we are nowhere close to there, it's just the same filming location. So in case you had a weird feeling that you have seen this place before, that is indeed the case. As far as the sequence itself goes, Sure, it's goofy as f but I thought it was a ton of fun to be honest. It doesn't really do much for the story, and I honestly think it is there purely for the sake of having an action scene. But whatever, monkey brain happy. And another fun fact, this episode holds the record for the most on-screen walker deaths, as over 300 are killed here. So hey, that's pretty cool. Oh, and this is also where the whole Morning of Fat Joey scene takes place, which I mentioned last time, so that is just some additional comedy gold. Back at Alexandria, we have another add-in of Trevor, or I mean Simon, visiting in their search for Daryl. And as much as I love Simon's character, this entire sequence really doesn't add anything to the episode and is another one of those scenes that seem a tad bizarre in retrospect. We'll get to this more in a second, but while it does fledge out the whole conflict from a realistic perspective, it ultimately feels more like filler than anything else. And again, here you have to note that fine line The Walking Dead walks between telling a story and between being realistic. Because sure, it makes sense that they are searching for Daryl, but did we really need to see this? I don't think so. Though hold that thought for now. Finally, in the last minutes of the premiere, we get to what is likely the most controversial group in the entirety of The Walking Dead. The Garbage People. And oh boy, what is there even to say about the Garbage People? 
And yes, I know they're technically called the scavengers, but they are the garbage people, okay? Not to immediately jump to the negatives, I do admit, the scene of Rick simply smiling as they appear was actually awesome. Both because it set up a mini mystery of sorts of why exactly might he be smiling, as well as because it clearly showed us a Rick that wasn't finally just staring into the distance in sheer despair as he has been for a vast majority of the season. Though, aside from that, everything about them is so jank. You know a group is just weird when they stick out in a series that is based on a comic book, right? And no, nothing even remotely close to this happens in the book. There are no weird spiky boy walkers, no broken language people, no bizarre leaders who want to lay with Rick, and definitely not some hilariously bad CG. What? What do you mean there's no CG in comic books? And what I think sours me a bit on this entire thing is because much of it has already been retconned pretty heavily. I will say that the explanation we got in World Beyond about Jadis speaking in broken language to essentially just create a cult was a cool little addition, but to me at least, everything else that has been retconned since seems extremely crowbardian. So yeah, at least for me personally, long story short, I didn't like the garbage people then and I really don't like them now. And again, it's just yet another case of numbers on both sides being hilariously inflated for no other reason than he he, big number go brrrr. And yeah, I joked about it before, but here we also get the infamous CG incident, where the background in this shot of Rick is scuffed on royal proportions. And the funniest part is that this wouldn't even be the worst example of this in Season 7, which again leaves me asking, what was going on behind the scenes? What was up with the budgets, and why was AMC seemingly actively holding back the show despite the ridiculous numbers it was still seeing? Why would you sacrifice the quality of the show when it comes to things like CG, and just add these countless extras that frankly nobody cared about? It's one of those questions we'll likely have to wait a long, long time to get answered with NDAs and all, but shots like these, no matter how you swing it, seriously do not belong in a show as big as The Walking Dead. I'll be the first guy to say that we should cut the production team some slack, but again, a shot like this, I mean, how did it even get past quality control? It doesn't take a turbo nerd to spot that this shot isn't exactly perfect. But alright, garbage people aside, another entirely new arc stems from Richard, Daryl, and Carol. A dude named Richard does also exist in the book, but aside from sharing a name, they are essentially nothing alike. So for all intents and purposes, just think of him as a TV show exclusive character. And before we get to him, we also see the much anticipated reunion between Daryl and Carol. Perhaps not surprisingly, this is another sequence that is up there with my favorites of the season. Not just because of the duo's incredible acting and dynamic, but also because of its implications in the story. Carol's arc throughout much of Season 7 has been about running away. So this scene where Daryl just lies and says that everyone back at Alexandria is fine and that the saviors were dealt with, is almost cathartic because we finally know that Carol would maybe get some peace of mind. That is of course very short-lived, but when taken in isolation, I absolutely love this one. The only problem I have with it is how jarring it feels because it's so incredibly late into the season. This clearly has absolutely nothing to do with the story itself, but because of all the bottle episodes, it's easy to overlook that many of the characters we've been seeing throughout the season are yet to even meet, and this is a very good example of that. Not sure if it's a me thing or not, but this entire sequence just feels a bit off with how late into the season it is. Yet another entirely new addition to the show is our pickle boy doctor, man in black, Eugene. Obviously, as with almost any Josh McDermott scene, absolutely all of these are excellent. Especially the whole discussion he has with Laura about all the snacks they have available. In terms of comic parallels though, I suppose the closest thing to the whole Eugene being taken by Negan is what I mentioned last time where later in All Out War he is also captured. But the circumstances there are quite different and so the entire thing is also, well, entirely different. Also on Eugene's and the Savior's side, we get a bit of an inversion as in the show, Negan would try to convince Dwight that they are both on Negan's side, while in the book, it would be Dwight trying to convince Eugene that they are both on Rick's side. So it's essentially just mirroring the scene. 
And speaking of Dwight, him getting beat up and getting thrown in jail is also all TV show exclusive. Since the whole thing was instigated by Daryl's escape, there really is no counterpart to anything close to that in the book, so yeah, all TV show made. And lastly, one nitpick that I have with this entire thing is that Negan burns their doctor as punishment, but to me, this doesn't seem like Negan at all. I get the whole angle of him being sus, but the entire reasoning behind Negan is that people are a resource. Let alone a trained doctor, something that is not only incredibly rare, but one of the most valuable assets a group might have. Yeah, he says that he'll just join the Hilltops doctor, but in the book, this is exactly why Negan didn't touch their food, for example. He wants the survivors to work for them, and taking their doctor is a big, big deal. A simple infection is enough to kill after all. So this just seems like a really dumb move, especially from the comic perspective where Negan would never do and never actually does something like this. Alright, enough about the Sanctuary, then we get to another highly controversial episode, mostly because it once again involves the trash folk. Put very, very briefly, 100% of this episode is TV show exclusive. And while I do admit, the whole abandoned theme park vibe is one that I would absolutely love to revisit in a nighttime setting, because of course I do. This episode is so all over the place that it literally ignores one of the show's most crucial aspects. Walkers are attracted to sound. Michonne is just casually shooting at the fair games, and the walkers don't seem the least bit worried. I get having the dichotomy of people having fun in the apocalypse while still being surrounded by the dead, but come on, you can tell me this isn't just sloppy. And again, in cases like this, this is not CG or anything, this is just an oversight. So was this entire season just terribly rushed? Just what exactly was going on behind the scenes? And then we of course, get to that thing. Remember how in the season 2 video I said? Note the quality of CGI here for the future, by the way. Yeah, well it's time for us to get to the infamous CG deer that is just as uncanny as that model of old Zuck. And again, I just do not know what was going on with season 7. And for the 500th time, yes, producing the show is hard, but it's just weird seeing these sorts of mishaps in a show as big as The Walking Dead. Even the most basic of quality checks surely would have caught this. So I'm just left asking, were they in a rush, whether it was a budget thing, or what was going on? I know Shiva was costly, but this is, well, just a yikes. Editing Kuroto jumping in with some extra news from earlier in this year that I had apparently missed. In an interview with Katie Oshanesi, another Walking Dead mega fan, which, by the way, can I get an interview? Pretty please? Anyone at AMC? I need answers. Jokes aside, Aaron McLean, the VFX lead, sheds some more light on this scene that honestly makes it sound even worse. Long story short, he wasn't even around for when the scene was created, but he basically explains that this isn't a CGI deer at all. This is a real deer shot at a certain angle at just a random location, and they then just attempted to superimpose it onto the scene, expecting it to look decent. And based on what he says here, it was very much a time crunch situation. So again, I'm just left asking, what was going on behind the scenes? How close to the deadline were they working if they shipped this? I am not a VFX artist, let's be clear on that. But they should have had at least some time to at least clean it up a little bit, right? Because this is uncanny. But anyway, that is the explanation of the infamous scene. Take that for what you will. So yeah, as much as I love the Rick Michonne dynamic in this one, the episode itself is neither particularly great or exactly important in the grand scheme of things. Following this, we get another mostly kingdom focus episode, and again, basically every single thing here is a TV add-in. That said, as I've mentioned before, I love the kingdom in the book, so seeing it more was actually a win in my book. Especially when we get some absolutely stunning shots such as these. And yes, the CG is already getting a tad dicey with Shiva here too, but that aside, I honestly think this was one of the strongest episodes of the latter half, even if it is literally based around melons. Yes, if you have forgotten, the primary plot for this episode is instigated by melons. Literal melons. 
jokes and melons aside, most of the story surrounding Morgan and Richard in this episode was top tier Walking Dead in my opinion. The entire storyline of Richard setting them up expecting to be shot, but getting Benjamin killed is obviously an extremely tragic death that I don't think anyone really saw coming. And all of that of course prompts Morgan to begin drifting back into his clear persona. Which would of course be absolutely excellent, had I not seen what happens to him in Fear and it made any sense whatsoever. Fear roast aside, I do actually think that Morgan's arc throughout the Negan arc, at least in the main story, is super strong. I mentioned this when I talked about all the seasons while ranking them, link to my second channel in the description by the way, but the only problem I had with Morgan's story is that we never really saw that push-pull nature of his clear persona with Rick. It is barely touched on in season 8, but definitely not here. Imagine how interesting that snap would have been if Morgan had already been tempted by the much more ruthless Rick after he reached Alexandria. But instead, his pacifism in many many instances just looks extremely childish, only for him to snap immediately. That was obviously the point, and he is an extremely traumatized character. But the fact that it has nothing to do with Rick and happens because of an entirely new character who, in universe, he met a literal week ago, just feels both odd and like a missed opportunity with how much their reunion was cooked up. That said, the scenes of Morgan wandering around after Benjamin's death were incredible, and the cinematography really sold you on that bewilderment with all these sudden snaps between different times and places. And also, I didn't really mention this before, but I really enjoyed how Gavin offered a bit of a different perspective on the Saviors, as he always seemed like one of the most level-headed among the Saviors. Which is of course on full display after Jared shoots Benjamin, as Gavin is actually angry with Jared for shooting and killing a teenager in cold blood, telling him to begin walking back to the sanctuary on foot. And then that brief moment of humanity on Gavin's face as he learns that Benjamin is in fact dead was just also top tier acting by the way. Far far later we'd of course even get to see him express remorse for the things he's done under Negan so all in all, I think this sort of empathetic yet still ruthless savior leader archetype was actually a great addition to the show. And lastly, the entire sequence with Richard after Morgan figures out what his scheme was is absolutely excellent. The fact that throughout the entire scene, Morgan just stares at him as Rich goes on his speech was just so incredibly tense that I seriously couldn't take my eyes off the screen. Obviously, we know that no one in the kingdom has seen the true clear version of Morgan, so we also have a little bit of that information asymmetry, where we as the viewers know that he is basically a beast being held back right now while Richard is seemingly actively trying to provoke him. And so all we're waiting for is for Morgan to just snap. And while he never does in this particular sequence, I think you'll agree that the acting on both sides here was also just excellent. Moving on to the hilltop where, again, essentially all of this is exclusive to the show, and reportedly this is another instance of episode 13 and 14 being filmed in reverse order but switched before airing, just like we've already seen with episode 2 and 3. Because they are bottle episodes with self-contained stories, that's perhaps not surprising. As for the episode itself, here we see Sasha and Rosita scheming to go after Negan, but Sasha then betrays Rosita and goes in solo. As far as their characters go, I do think that them reminiscing about Abraham and all that was some great dialogue, but because this plays into something I want to discuss in a second, just hold that thought for now. As for comic similarities, the whole Sasha going in solo thing is a remix from what Holly does later on, but because All Out War has already begun in the book, it's quite a bit different at the same time. And lastly, I really enjoyed the maggie Daryl dynamic in this episode. Obviously for much of the season, and even now years later, the debate has been raging on around whether Daryl is responsible for Glenn's death or not. So seeing Maggie make it clear that she doesn't hold anything against Daryl was sort of a nice confirmation for the viewers to hear. But of course, she says that in her opinion and to her, he never did anything wrong. For the viewers on the other hand, well, the debate is still raging on. And with how big the Negan moment was, it's perhaps not surprising that many still blame Daryl for what happened with Glenn. Especially because Glenn was one of the most beloved characters in the show. But with that said, you might have noticed that we've blitzed through so so many episodes, many of which are extremely character centric and haven't really explored them that much. And it's here where I want to propose the meandering hypothesis. 
The thing with The Walking Dead is that the adaptation took the relationships and stories from the book and almost always expanded them. Even as soon as season 1, the love triangle between Rick, Shane and Lori was expanded massively. The Atlanta camp story was expanded with characters like Carol, whose family drama also played a major role. Entirely new storylines were also developed around Beth and the Green family, etc, etc. The show always explored deep and personal stories, and that's what I think the show also tried to do now. The problem is, the cast is so, 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 so much bigger, and that is simply impossible. I've mentioned this in passing, but almost every single episode of Season 7 is extended. Something that between Seasons 1 and 6 happened literally less than 5 times. And I think this is what Gimple was always best at. He took something small like the Hunters and spun them into Terminus, which still stands as the high point of the series in the eyes of many. But now, that balance is way, 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 way off. There are simply too many individual stories to tell, and the bigger narrative suffers as a result. Not to mention that even more groups were added, all of whom require even more time. So you're left with these countless self-contained episodes which barely progress the bigger narrative. Many of the episodes we've talked about today are great when taken in isolation. But that's the problem. They are taken in isolation. In a bizarre turn of events, unlike most other series that have the big idea down and all the small details suffer, The Walking Dead in many cases told incredible character-centric narratives, but it was the bigger story that was absolutely all over the place. Many of these relationships were great, but they did nothing for the bigger story. We'll get to this even more with Season 8. But the thing with adapting a action sequence from a comic or a manga is that it is notoriously hard to do because an entire page of action on paper can literally be adapted to 15 seconds. That's just how translating material works. An entire page of people shooting weapons and talking has to happen fast. Otherwise, the action in the scene will not be there. Yet somehow, The Walking Dead leans so, so far in the opposite direction of expanding anything and everything that even the action sequences felt meaningless. Because we've still got a ton of story to cover, this is where I'll leave it for now. But I think there's a lot to explore on how the relationship-centric storytelling harmed the bigger picture here, which was further bogged down due to the sheer amount of characters. So yeah, basically I think a vicious cycle of sorts was created where you just expanded what was expanded what was expanded. Am I completely off base or do you agree with me? I would genuinely love to hear your thoughts on all this. But with all that said, it's now finally all hands on deck as the group rallies up their allies, gets weapons and the march to war begins. Again, since the Ocean Side was heavily remixed for the show, the entire recruitment is TV show exclusive. And because Negan never took away the survivors' guns, the entire gathering them up thing is also TV show exclusive. And speaking of which, particularly in retrospect, the whole gun scavenging thing honestly seems super bizarre considering how big of a non-problem it ultimately was. They lose their guns, they then scavenge for a bit, and they're suddenly fully stocked up as if nothing at all happens. Considering how many communities there are out there, especially in the TV version, and that even before this conflict we heard that the area around Alexandria has been picked absolutely clean, everything about it just feels like a super artificial way of extending the uprising arc. But anyway, on the other side of the conflict we have Sasha who, after going in solo, was captured by the saviors and was thrown into a prison cell. Here we of course see a particularly disgusting savior named David come to see Sasha. This is YouTube and I can't say the word, but you've all seen the episode, so you know what he's here to do. But just when he tries making a move, old Negan pops in and has a very candid conversation with him about how what he's doing is against the rules and always has been. When it comes to these sorts of things, Negan does very much have a zero tolerance policy, and so old David is poked with a particularly big knife and that is the end of that. As far as this sequence goes, it is lifted right out of the comic book, but the circumstances and the time frame during which it happens are quite different. In the book, Polly gets captured during All Out War, and that's when this entire thing goes down. Only major difference is that in the book, Negan doesn't enter the room in his cold and spooky tone, but rather he barges in already enraged, but the outcome is exactly the same. David is poked, and that's the end of that. 
And in a broader sense, this is another one of those scenes that have sparked discussions among the Negan haters and the Negan stands. Because here, he clearly doesn't tolerate the least bit of this behavior. But on the other hand, all of his wives aren't exactly there because they want to be either. Obviously, they say they do, but it's purely out of necessity and survival, none of them are happily there. So it brings up those questions of morality and how much of it is purely Negan rationalizing his own twisted desires. Another remix happens with Dwight, where, similar to the book, he wants to flip on Negan, but unlike the book where he himself pops up, it's Rosita introducing him to the rest of the group. Also, Rick immediately going to punch him is given to Daryl for, I think, obvious reasons. Though broadly speaking, their exchange is very similar between the two versions. He explains that Negan has his wife, that he got a scar at Negan's place, etc, etc. But of course, Dwight flipping in the show is also a bit more complicated since his role is expanded as is. Notably, him already flipping on Daryl back in Season 6, which justifiably makes this entire thing that much harder to believe. That said though, the entire sequence in the prison cell as they're just laying out their plans is incredible and certainly build up a lot of hype for the upcoming conflict. Though, before we get to that, the finale opens up with some extremely cheeky scenes as we see a close-up of Sasha listening to music in the dark. And that then of course drifts into a series of flashbacks where, number one, we see the return of Big Man Abe. Obviously, this is a big win for anyone and everyone, so I am happy. Jokes aside, I've already talked about this before, but the book purposefully avoided flashbacks. But I think it's one of those things that the show has always leveraged to the fullest. Especially when it comes to these sorts of dream sequences. It just gives us a very raw insight into what the character is actually thinking, which I absolutely love. And with scenes like these, or even the dream sequences of the dinner they have in Alexandria, I think they really hit the nail on the head. And of course, there's also the brief scene we get of Sasha and Maggie before they met Aaron back in Season 5. And while that might not have some gigantic story implications, it was just another beautifully shot scene that really captures the emotional dichotomy of this episode's overall narrative. So yeah, I know some people think that the dream sequences are generally overdone in the series, but I for one absolutely love them when they are done right. Of course, with what I talked about before regarding the sheer number of characters we have and how that inflates the season, it also contributes to the bloat we saw in this season, but in isolation, it is an incredible sequence nonetheless. Though, with all that said, after Jade has sold the survivors out, Negan is on his way to Alexandria yet again, where our pickle boy Eugene addresses the community. As I said at the very top of the video, obviously a lot of stuff here is drastically remixed because, well, in the book, this entire thing happened in the space of two issues rather than nine episodes. So with that, the entire initial confrontation at the gates is of course entirely new, the entire garbage people betrayal is also new, Negan bringing in Sasha is again also new, but the zombified Sasha springing out on him is a remix from the book. Just like with the Holly scene I mentioned before, a similar Trojan horse deal would happen later on, but again, the circumstances around the whole thing would be quite different, so we'll talk about that when we get there. And I do admit, while I do massively prefer how the comic handled basically all of these events, I do think that the confrontation at the gates was actually super cool. If it had happened about 6 episodes sooner, it would of course be much better, but in terms of building anticipation for the inevitable war, it was awesome. Especially with how the Sasha plan is revealed to us, because again, while the gist of it was quite similar, it was still a fairly substantial remix from the books. Namely, we get the flashback to how Negan never actually wanted her to get into the coffin in the first place, and that it was rather Sasha's plan to hide in there, take the pill Eugene gave her, and bank on the fact that it would be Negan who'd open the coffin first. So yeah, an interesting remix all things considered. But as we cut back to the present, with Sasha springing out, the war basically begins right away. And so with that, we have finally caught up to the books, though that doesn't mean the differences end there, because there are still many, many, many. First off, in the book, Andrea is of course the sniper. In the show, on the other hand, that is Michonne. And as much as I love Michonne, I still find it funny how hard they tried to cram in the fact that she is apparently a good shot now. In the book, Andrea has been an incredible shot ever since the first issues. She single-handedly picked off most of the governor's forces after all. But this is something that the show had obviously never planned for. 
And so now Michonne, who has always fought hand to hand, suddenly becomes her sharpshooter. But that aside, in both versions they're caught off guard either by saviors or the trash people and a fight breaks out, where they are both brutally beaten. And also, in both versions it seems like it is Andrew or Michonne who fall to their deaths, but it of course turns out to be the person they are fighting. And with that, in the show they are basically captured right away and a second lineup begins. In the book though, before the lineup is properly formed, Carl peeks out and shoots at Negan but hits Lucille instead, which is where the Rosita thing was taken from last time. Obviously, this enrages Negan and once again all hell breaks loose. In the book, Jesus suddenly springs up and makes his way right to Negan, quickly outmatching him in hand-to-hand -hand combat and pulling a gun on him. In the show, on the other hand, that entire surprise factor of course comes from Shiva mauling one of the saviors, which happens a tad bit later in the book. And again, obviously this would be a massive rewrite, but considering Carl dies anyway in just a few more episodes, him getting the bat here could have actually been pretty interesting, but hey, okay, whatever. But in both versions, the joint alliance arrives and begins to fight back the saviors. Though, in the show, we of course get some incredible lines from our boy Negan, such as the famous that the widow is alive, guns are blazing, among many, many others. And soon thereafter, the saviors are sent retreating. But with that said, as great as the sequence is, I do have more than a few problems with this entire thing in the show. Number one, the sheer number of people makes this entire thing just so, so hard to believe. Keep in mind that while Negan had his reinforcements, his group was still relatively small in the book. In the show, on the other hand, they had both the saviors as well as the entirety of the garbage people who, keep in mind, were fighting from within. So this entire battle sequence seems like the most unbelievable thing ever in terms of no one actually getting shot simply because how many people there are. Like, literally, no one important is actually shot here. Number two, and I do admit this is a nitpick, I don't know why, but the uplifting music we see in this one is just a bit jarring to me. Obviously, this season has been all about the group getting beat down, so this is a payoff to all of that. But to me, it felt seriously cheesy. Especially with, again, the numbers being inflated to ridiculous proportions, it felt like an all-over-the-place Hollywood action scene rather than a cold, down-to-earth, and a brutal survival story. Again, I don't know how much of this is just my own personal bias toward the book, but that's how I honestly felt about it. And then on the same note, number three. How ridiculously inconsequential the garbage people are. If you really boil this entire thing down, they changed nothing in what happened here. The only person we really care about who died in this entire grand takedown scheme was Sasha, and that had nothing to do with the attack itself. No one super important died in the comics either, but again, in the book, this was a routine checkup, not a grand declaration as it was in the show. So yeah, TLDR, to me, the entire emotional weight of this first major battle was mostly lost because it just lost its grit from the book and just felt like a pointless action sequence. Do let me know what you think about this entire sequence though. Am I a negative Andy? Am I not? I would love to hear your thoughts. Last scenes of this season are very explicit declarations in the war where, in the show, Negan calmly walks out and tells his people that they are indeed going to war. But the thing is, in the book, this scene was a bit more creative, so let me just read it out to you. And I quote, We are the big swinging <coughs> of this world. Have been for a long <coughs> time. But it seems people are forgetting that. So now, our big swinging is going to swing harder and faster until we take off like a helicopter and blow all of these away. So yeah, in case you didn't notice, one has a bit more flair to it. And the very, very last moments of the season basically bring us full circle, as we hear the narration of the leaders as they find and put down Sasha. And then finally, we see all the leaders of the Joint Alliance address the people as we zoom in on Glenn's, and of course Herschel's, pocket watch. So with that, All Out War has well and truly started. And that is exactly where we'll be picking up next time. And that's the video. Luckily, I managed to get this one recorded before I got sick, so you'll only have to bear with the 80-year-old Darth Vader version of me for just a little bit. 
That said, with Season 7 now wrapped up, I cannot wait to delve into the many ups and downs of Season 8, which should hopefully be a tad shorter than the usual 4-5 to five video series. But with that said, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my rambling, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.